All right, our first panel. Uh, a lot of this, uh, a lot of today and um, probably tomorrow is going to deal with political cartooning yet to come, uh, cartooning in a digital age and the internet age. But as Frank mentioned that uh, political cartooning is an art form that predates the republic itself. And I've always found it interesting going through uh, collections of old political cartoons, how you can come to understand the political history of the United States. Um, cartoons provide a snapshot of, of, political, uh, of political opinions, of political mores at any given time. And we have with us our first panel today is uh, Sandy Northrup and Stephen Hess, and they're the authors of American Political Cartoons 1754 to 2010. And if they'd like to come out. Yeah. 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 Are you on mic up? I, I, I'm on podium and, and Steve's wandering. Okay, it sounds good. And you know what I don't know is how to click this to get our things to go forward. Big green button. It's the big green button. <laughs> <laughs> let me, let me um, tell you, Sandy is going to be doing the heavy lifting. Uh, and I'm going to be doing the footnoting or kibitzing. Uh, and, um, but I did want to make one note before we, we start, and that is that for me, it's not the first keynote I've given to cartoonists. I gave one in 1998, and uh, I found it, and I just want to uh, quote from myself for a moment. I say, every time I've ever talked to a group of cartoonists, I've always felt as though I were talking to a buggy whip convention in the 1920s. The world is about to cave in and you're about to become thoroughly obsolete, I say. And then I say, I think it's going to be a pretty glorious future, thanks to the internet. All the internet means is that young people are going to have an opportunity to be seen despite the fact that newspapers, their major vehicle, are now uh, co uh, contracting. You now have glorious opportunities to get away from strictly political issues and to say something important with a bite about other issues as well. It's a great time to expand your field of interest. So that's where I stopped, and the conversation started, and the cartoonists raised their hand. First up, Mr. Oliphant. Mr. Oliphant said, I think it's very heartening what Steve says, but we've never figured out how we're going to pay for the Internet. So I think the this, we may continue 14 years later and figure out if you have found a way uh, and whether it is indeed the glorious future that at least I predicted. Sandy, why don't we All go right. to history? Uh, on to history, or backwards to history. Uh, we're going to start today where we, everyone always starts with our hero, Tom Nast. Well, you, you guys, we all know about Tom Nast, and we all know why he's so important. And we all know that in 1871, uh, he let his readers know that, that something was amiss and that with the leaders in New York City in t at the Tammany Ring. And uh, as he began his campaign, uh, we were to learn who stole the people's money. The most interesting thing about it, I think, for Steve and me, is that uh, he decided to just uh, single out one guy, and that's the guy laying down on the bottom, Boss Tweed. Uh, what's been interesting to Steve and I are the sociological aspects of some of the stuff. You know, what was Harper's Weekly, for whom um, Tom uh, did four or five cartoons uh, a week? It was kind of the television of the day, that people would sit in the living rooms and, and chat about it. They'd go and there would be something on Europe or travel in Europe. There would be something on those Indians out in the West. And uh, it, it, what, uh, they could spend a whole week just going through the pages and talking about, that's for you, Steve. And the, the, when he began to focus on the Tammany Ring, he specifically focused on uh, Old Boss Tweed. And the reason he did that was because, not because that uh, our friend was the most corrupt or the most evil or anything, but he had the physiognomy that made for great cartooning. Because when you look at, at our man, uh, you know, he was pretty normal, except he did have a rather extended had. He really did have a big nose, and so he's what you cartoonists really love, and, uh, you know, Nastus ran away with it. We always like this cartoon, and I'm sure many of you know why, is because it, this is right after the election, and although uh, it looks like a Tammany Hall was destroyed, and once again, our guys, uh, Tom and, and his friends, uh, destroyed, brought them down, in fact, uh, Tammany Hall 
uh, the Tammany Ring got reelected. And uh, power the, of the cartoonist. Also, the New York Times. Five years later, uh, the tweet had fled, and he was found in Spain. And he's found in Spain because this cartoon, which was done in, in I think it's 17, I can't remember the date. Anybody remember the date? April 76. 76. Yeah. Uh, uh, a local policeman saw this picture. He thought the tweed was a kidnapper. And uh, it said, I know where that guy is. He was picked up. Tweed was brought back. And he was sentenced to prince, uh, prison and died died there. I should add, by the way, uh, he was sentenced to prison. But then the warden gave him his parlor in the prison, for which he paid $75 a week, which is a pretty good fee. So, so it goes in American prisons. <clears throat> Nass fame grew. And here, I love this, our artist occupation gone. He has nothing else to do because we see over here Tammany dead. Uh, the, these, everything that he used to cartoon about, he says it is no more because Thomas Nass has taken care of it. <laughs> But he, years went by, he went out, he was a very successful lecturer, he had a grand panorama that he traveled with, he would do the standard, uh, you know, chalk talk, and he'd tell the war stories of bring down the Tammany Ring. By the way, he had, uh, war stories, he had been a, a illustrator, a battlefield illustrator during the Civil War. So war stories also involved this, the, a grand panorama of, of, of the war that uh, was over a half century ago. But by this time, by 1900, uh, you know, newspapers are beginning to, to be the strong carriers of what, where the cartoons are. Uh, he couldn't do a daily cartoon. He was just too elaborate in the way he approached his work. And, uh, but he did the, do this cartoon and sent it out before he left uh, to go to Ecuador as a counsel there. And the most interesting part about it is that Tom Nass would die nine months later in Ecuador of yellow fever, and his body was eventually brought back, but it wasn't easy. Um, it, it's, it's sad. Uh, it, it, it's sad to see kind of the status of this cartoon because it was so. I guess it was quickly drawn, but it's it's really uh, not in the quality that we're used to. But what Mr. Nass did leave us with is a set of symbols that do endure. And the one that we all know is the Republican elephant. Would By the I, way, look there. He makes the the Democrats into the into the fox. They're not they're not the uh, the, the donkey. Uh, you'll, you'll comment on that. But I didn't know is that he also created Santa Claus, which actually comes out of a German tradition. Yeah. And uh, I, I thought that that was really fun uh, back many years ago when I started to do this work with Steve. He's given credit for absolutely everything. I turned on, uh, as, I, as it does every morning at, at, on Wednesday, on NPR, Garrison Keillor, 6.30, and he's telling me that Thomas Nast has uh, invented uh, Uncle Sam which is very nice, except the first Uncle Sam we can find is 1832, and Thomas Nast was born in 1840. So if you want to write to, to Garrison Keillor, it always says to, to write him, I'm thinking about it. <laughs> what Nast didn't create was the donkey. Yeah. And can you tell us a little bit about that cartoon, Steve? No. No? Andrew Jackson. <laughs> we know it's Andrew Jackson, and mm -hmm. I, I think, we think it has something to do with... Uh, the fallout. Uh, yeah, anybody it's, here it's, can it's tell us Martin more about Van that? It's probably Martin Van Buren right behind him, too. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And behind him, I believe, is Van Buren. Yeah, I just yeah, said. Yeah. Thanks, Colin. Um, it was in color. Uh, so today, we're going to spend a little time figuring out where uh, symbols did get their start. And uh, this, this cartoon by Ben Franklin was the first to be published in an American paper, and within a month it was published in virtually every uh, newspaper on the continent. The thing I really like about Ben Franklin is not only was he the first American cartoonist, but he was the first politician cartooned by American cartoonists, which is a, a double header, which I, that, the, the, this was 1854, he was cartooned in about 1864, uh, 1764, yeah. And the, as many of you know, the, that the whole concept of this was if the stake could be, parts could be joined back together before sunset, 
um, it would survive. And this was his uh, tip of the hat to what the colonies had to do in order to fight the British. There was one guy, and his name was James Rivington, who was a pro-British editor. And he, he put out this quip because he thought it was very funny that the Americans would choose a snake as their symbol. Ye sons of sedition, how comes it to pass that America is typed by a snake in the grass? Mm -hmm. But the American colonies would have the last laugh because, and James uh, Gilray, an English cartoonist, shows the Yorktown having been surrounded by the American rattlesnake. Uh, actually, let me, let me do something. Uh, Gilray is sort of fun uh, because, uh, because I actually saw a Gilbert Ray being produced. And the reason it was being produced was the, somebody you all probably knew well, and that's Draper Hill. And he owned Gilray plates. Uh, and I watched him actually make a Gilray, uh, you know, 20, 20 years ago. Gilray was one of the, the greatest cartoonists in all history. And the most famous cartoon of this period is uh, in the gerrymander. And I can never say this name, Mary. Right. Elkanah Tilsdale? Mm hmm But that's what he did? Yeah. And uh, when one Massachusetts colony's voting district was arbitrarily realigned to ensure the re-election of the current governor, Elbridge Chair Gary, right. Gary, uh, Tildale, Tildale uh, drew the creature showing the realignment suggested and dubbed it the gerrymander. Yeah. Uh, in fact, it's, it's often attributed to Gilbert Stewart, so a, a, a bit more garbage that comes up. Uh, but it is a man named Tildale who, who is the creator of the most famous cartoon of that period. And the thing for me that's always interested me most about cartoons is how they show certain things uh, always are coming back. And certainly the gerrymander is alive and well in American politics today. Uncle Sam's position as America's number one symbol was cemented by James Montgomery Flagg during World War I. Actually, that is James Montgomery Flagg. He used himself as the, uh, as for, for the portrait he painted. And that cartoon, uh, that poster, was reprodu reproduced four million times uh, in World War I. So how does Uncle Sam come about? This is uh, one of the first symbols. Uh, this is Brother Jonathan, and he's forcing uh, John Bull to swallow uh, the, the bloody cup. And in, in the end, um, it, it's just... Uh, one pairing off against the other. Yeah, now, no, th th this is, uh, this is uh, an etching. Some of these cartoons of this period are wood blocks. They can't get very far as long as that was the, the way that they were produced. It wasn't until lithography came in about 30 years later that you could reproduce them enough to, to make a living on it. And this is the cartoon of, of Uncle Sam that, that Steve was just referring to. 1837, Edward Williams Clay, and it's uh, Uncle Sam sick with the grip. And the grip seems to be the bank failure, the calamitous bank failure that went on that year. <clears throat> but this is where there's a lot of symbols, and we could go in and read it all, but it, it just, it's again for people who have a lot of time to spend uh, looking over uh, cartoons like this. And, and many of these things would be posters, and, and they would be handouts, and you could see them fairly big. Yeah, in other words, you, 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 you paid for uh, Courier and Ives was the biggest producer of that. You, you, it, it wasn't as if they appeared in newspapers. You paid a few cents to have, to have a poster that you could frame and put on your refrigerator wall door. <laughs> it's a joke. <laughs> Icebox, all right. By the time of the Civil War, uh, Uncle Sam's long, lanky body had taken an uncanny resemblance to Abraham Lincoln. This is Abraham Lincoln here, but you can see how, how the striped pants and the starred vest, uh, they're, they're beginning to become inter interchangeable. By the way, note, note punch. The, uh, the British were really after uh, Abraham Lincoln uh, during the Civil War. This is typical of a punch cartoon. And we're going to go through some of the places and watch uh, Uncle Sam's evolution. This one uh, we came upon a little while ago, and. Uh, it's, it's really, uh, it's fun. Uh, it's during 
the uh, uh, you know this phase of manifest destiny, and we've got Uncle Sam, and he's holding up a Filipino. We've got uh, we have uh, we have reached their shores, and the line is a bigger job than he thought for. Uncle Sam says, behave, you fool, darn me, if I ain't most sorry, I undertook to rescue you. Mm. And, uh, you know, this, this cartoon's uncanny similarity to recent events. Uh, if you replace the Filipino with an Iraqi or Afghanistani, um, uh, we, we see it all circles back. Mm. Here's a bootleg, Uncle Sam, uh, 1920. You can see the, yeah, there we go. <laughs> Roland Kirby? Yes. Roland Kirby, good. Who's out there? Who's, 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 I think everybody knows. Right. I've, I've got most of them labeled. I see I forgot that one. And now we're jumping ahead to suddenly uh, our friend Lyndon Baines Johnson, LBJ, takes on a notable I Want Y'all, so with a southern draw. Here we've got an auth cartoon from... Uh, 1974, uh, time of uh, they, they had embargoed oil to the U.S. and we were we were feeling the pain. Jeff Danziger's uh, economic crisis, 1987, and this is one of my all-time favorite cartoons by Dana Summers, uh, who never comes to these events, and we ought to try to get him to come. Uh, and uh, the use of Uncle Sam, nothing had to be said the day after 9-11. Cal? Is he here? Uh, he's Where's not here Cal? right now. Uh, no. Uh, 2008, for The Economist, outsourcing jobs. And then my, one of my favorite Jim Borgman, I have a lot of favorite Jim Borgmans, but uh, you know, this is what I used to, to try to talk about, you know, what all of you felt when uh, the Soviet Union fell and all of the, you're taking it all. And you see the USSR, arms race, evil empire, oh, commie, yeah. uh, all of that. It, it just absolutely, just the, the hammer and sickle, uh, evil, evil, we've got that Cold War is down there at the very corner. We got the KGB. Um, then we've got the Khrushchev saying, "We will bury you." Uh, Jim had a quite a, quite a good time with that one. So as we said, we're backtracking again. And by 1900, newspapers, uh, well, actually by the 1880s, uh, newspapers were beginning to come to the fore. They were replacing the weekly journals, and that all came about on a famous day in October in 1884 when the world uh, published the Royal Feast of Belshazzar. I can never say that. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's just, you know, it is, what's remarkable to me about this is, is that it's just such a crudely drawn cartoon. You know, there's at, nothing about that's it. That's the whole front page. The whole front page. Yeah. Uh, by the way, it was, it was, uh, McDougall did some of it, and then other artists did some of the rest. It was. Uh, uh, do you tell? Should we tell the history for those? That somebody back there will, will shout out and tell me exactly what happened. But in fact, uh, this is one cartoon that probably can be given credit for winning a presidential election uh, because um, it, it's it's Blaine uh, at Cleveland and um, it, this is New York. Uh, the, the New York Democrats plastered billboards all over the state with this, with this cartoon. Uh, Blaine lost the state by 1,100 votes. Had he won the state, he would have won the presidency. And so there are many who really do feel that this cartoon uh, settles uh, the, the uh, 1884 election. The world was owned by our friend Joe Pulitzer. Yep. And... Uh, he had first come into publishing with the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. He wanted to expand his empire, and he bought the world in, uh, let me see, 1883. And he had the New York market for the time being. But uh, there was a guy that w really wanted to follow in his footsteps, our friend uh, William Randolph Hearst. And in 1895, uh, 
he, he buys the New York Journal. And that, therein would start the great uh, circulation wars. Leon Barrett. Pulitzer, Hearst, War. Yeah, now, many of you know, and particularly Bob Harvey down there, uh, why they're wearing those yellow ro robes. Uh, it's because of the Yellow Kids. The Yellow Kid was a famous. This is the, the original registration of the Yellow Kid at the Library of Congress. Two, two things here, of course. Yellow journalism comes exactly from that. But more from a cartoonist's point of view, the cartoonist was smart enough, as he did there, was to register and, and own the copyright to it. And then they used it in a lot of advertising and so forth. And he became a very rich person. Think of it. The Yellow Kid was one of the favorites of, of everybody. Uh, it was just, a, it was vied for, it was bid for. They, they got into copyright wars. But, you know, every week, uh, this kind of toothless, hairless, adorable creature, you know, it takes it, it's the readers through the streets uh, of Hogan's Alley. And it really, it just, uh, I love to look at all the albums on, 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 Yellow Kid, because it just it, it, it really freezes a moment in time. And that color uh, from that date is so vivid. Uh, maybe USA Today will get around to being that good. We'll see. So, but, but at, this is the period of time where all cartoonists really become uh, the celebrities of the day. And they're called upon to, to cut ribbons and lead parades. And uh, it, it, it's, it's a fun time. There are over 2,000 cartoonists. There are maybe four or five to a newspaper, and it's, it's a wonderful time to, to be a cartoonist. There are many historical and, and even social milestones that can be rediscovered in looking at cartoons from the past. And we're going to go through a few uh, moments in time here. This is one of my favorite, and uh, many of you know who John McCutcheon was, but for those that don't, John McCutcheon was just this endearing guy who wrote, uh, drew for the Chicago Tribune, and he kind of looked on in the, the world of the 1800s, uh, rural, rural life, and uh, then suddenly everybody comes to the city. Mm -hmm. And he decides to portray the opening of Marshall Fields as this great event. It's like a national holiday where everybody brings their kids and they have a wonderful time. And of course, McCutcheon was cartoon was on the front page, the first page of the Chicago Tribune. That's, that's what they thought of him. But Liam Barrett found other ways to, to look at the department store of the time. I mean, you've got you know, all the individual small mom and pop stores. Are, are, those are the skulls. We have the obvious thing of greed. And it, it's just a two completely conflicting points of view. And that's wonderful in the period of the 1900s when you see these two. One is going to do the, the pure, the rural, the everything is fine. And the other is just uh, more of the masses coming out of the masses, fearing that, that what, what is to come. Yeah, uh, Vim isn't much of a magazine that didn't last long. But actually, we don't spend much t time on this. But this is the period, the last two decades, of the, of the 19th century, which is the great cartooning war between judge, Republican, and uh, a puck, uh, a Democratic, uh, uh, Kepler on one hand, uh, Bernard um, Gilliam on the other hand. Uh, I wish we could have spent more time on those, because every election, uh, they had a figure that followed through uh, and made their, their, their point week after week, and people gathered to, to see what they would come out with next week. And then came the women's rights movement. And uh, you know, th there's a wonderful book, I, I think it's called Make Way, uh, on uh, all of the cartoons that were about the women's movement between uh, the 1900s up to 1920, when finally the, the amendment is passed. Yeah, that life, by the way, is not the, the Henry Luce life, an earlier life which was really founded by uh, students from the Harvard Crimson. And it, uh, it, it had a much more effervescent uh, college humor uh, feeling to it than the, than the great uh, Judge and, and, uh, and Puck magazines, Punch magazines. And Laura Foster is, it was one of the few women cartoonists uh, then or now. Now this, Mike Peters, is really one of my favorites. <laughs> what are you doing after the victory party? The floors. <laughs> I mean, it, when he hits it, he really does. Uh, just moving forward and just the spontaneity 
of the drawing is, is wonderful. <laughs> Doug Marlette, at the same time, um, first dollar, first 59 cents. You know, and that came up in, in the Democratic platform uh, this year. So again, it's coming back. It all returns. Signe, uh, do, doing this, I talk about another issue that's come back. And this is during uh, the, the first Bush administration where he vowed uh, that the pro-abortion Freedom of Choice Act would not become long as, law as long as he was President of the United States. Prejudice is one of the things that, that we can track, and uh, I could do, we, Steve and I could do a whole thing on prejudice and its evolution, its downspin, its yeah. upspin in cartoons, and we've done a very quick job here uh, today because we're trying to do more of an overview. Our hero, Tom Nast, uh, hated the American black and the immigrants Irish, uh, almost as uh, each one equally. The ignorant vote he calls them, honors are easy. He perhaps, uh, being a German immigrant, uh, I, we think that, that Nash probably hated the Irish more. This is the day we celebrate where he shows these horrible monkey-faced Irish uh, you know, at a riot, beating the police that are the good guys. But, you know, he didn't just hold back on, on uh, let go on the Irish. There was also the Chinese. The nigger must go. The Chinaman must go. I can't read this. Uh, the, the poor barbarians can't understand our civilized Republican form of government. So, uh, the, Isn't that an ironic comment on the, quote, civilized yeah, government? Yeah, 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 yeah. Unbelievable. He, he, uh, he also hated Democrats. <laughs> he uh, was a great supporter of Ulysses S. Grant as president. This was in Puck, and it, you can see it says the anti-Chinese wall. The American wall goes up, and it's filled with law against race, and it's jealousy and all that. And the, original, uh, the Chinese original goes down as the Chinese come in and take over. So we're, now we're trying to do is block the Chinese. We'll let all you guys in. You're already here, but let's not have those Chinese. And, it, you know, it, 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 it's, again, the parallel, a wall or the border. If you build it, they will still come. Steve Benson in 2006. Well, we all saw Lilo yesterday and got to have his comments. Is he here today, this morning? Uh, uh, I, this was one of the new finds for me. And uh, just following his stuff over the years, I, I try to look at his cartoons every day now. Um, it, it's just to have such a strong voice for the Latino, um, Mexican immigrant community uh, is, is a wonderful thing to say, uh, have, and he does not hold back. Uh, the one thing that I particularly loved, and I could show you a lot of Lilo uh, cartoons, is the way he took a simple Arizona road sign and just added the guy with the gun <laughs> and turned it into his own symbol. and. Uh, I believe, and you, I would love to talk to anybody afterwards, uh, if, if he was the first one to begin to use that sign, or if somebody predated him, I'd love the update on that. But I, I believe he, he took it as his own and used the sign in many, many different ways. And there's a whole series of them, and, and you see, and I, I just, I, I just uh, my mouth dropped when I first saw, these were some of the first ones I saw, and terrific. And, and he's really been... Uh, a spokesperson, especially now for you know deportation, uh, what's going on in Arizona, as as was evidenced yesterday. Uh, African Americans, uh, how have they fared in uh, our cartoons? Well, we all know that early on the answer was not very good. Uh, this is Courier and Ives, and they they would they just went to town on these because they sold out every time they would print a series of of new um, etchings, these extra engravings. Um, uh, this is the Dark Town series. Uh, they would sell out. And they were all, you know, kind of, of the watermelon mentality. Mm -hmm. And uh, they got worse from there. The one cartoon that we don't have in here 
and I felt that they were really missing was the Edmund Duffy uh, 1930s cartoon. Um, it's called Marilyn My Marilyn. He was one of the few people with Baltimore Sun to uh, really show what was going on and, and call it, tell it like it was. He showed a particular one that we used in our book of, uh, of somebody being uh, lynched, and that was the one with the caption, Marilyn My Marilyn. It was strange to me when we began researching our first book in, in the 90s that how many, uh, how, how much there wasn't any caricaturing of uh, civil rights leaders. Uh, they, they just weren't there. Uh, Martin Luther King, for the most part, wasn't there. People were very uncomfortable having to try to, uh, you know, do, well, do I show the big lips or do I show the big nose or do I just, or do I just not do it at all? And I'm a big fan of Paul Conrad, but even he fell into this thing early on before they kind of get into stride of showing poor, cute, cherubic black kids being the symbol of a movement that was uh, much more than that, and the helicopters are flying off. Ollie Harrington was there, and uh, I had the pleasure of first hearing him, seeing him at one of Lucy's. Uh, meetings in Ohio State. How many years ago, Lucy? 92. 92. And quite a, what a guy he was. Uh, he was known in all the black papers uh, from New York to Chicago and then some, but he was rarely seen by an American audience. And starting in the uh, early 90s and uh, with the help of Lucy and others, uh, Ollie Harrington began to become known. And I, 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 can you walk over and tell I, us what yeah, that says? Yeah. Here, Brother Bootsy, take this extra hammer. I got it here in case the gentlemen of the law decides that this demonstration is too peaceful. Right. Uh, Ollie Harrington, uh, he spoke out. He was in, in the, uh, against, I'm sorry, he, during World War II, he showed what was going on for the black soldier. He continued that on, but he spent most of his life abroad uh, living in Germany. Now here, here we have, so the first demonstrations are happening in the 60s. Uh, this is how uh, Ollie Harrington deals with it. And this is another friend of ours, Bill Malden. Uh, let that one go, he says he don't want to be my equal. Uh, probably, uh, Bill at this point in time is doing just incredible stuff uh, on the civil rights movement. Uh, he said that he was a redneck and he always felt comfortable drawing rednecks. <laughs> And no one else by there was, by the way, was doing this sort of stuff either. I mean, uh, it was amazing how upfront he really was at this time. And then, and then along comes a you know a whole new generation of cartoonists, and we've got Jules Pfeiffer and the Village Voice. Can you go over there and we'll okay, read it let's, together? Let's do it. Together. So we're going to take this. He he is not a, you know a very subtle style. He's aiming at the northern liberal. And Shall I start off and you follow me? Yeah. Uh, oh, 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 if we're going to do big, we could all read that. Pardon me, sir, why are you following me? I'm your sit-in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh, you must have the wrong party. I I'm not a lunch counter. I'm a social sit-in, not a property sit-in. We integrate people. <laughs> uh, don't get it wrong. I understand what you're trying to do, uh, but I can't uh, take you to work with me. Have you ever taken a colored person to work with you? <laughs> Believe me, I, I would if I found one qualified. <laughs> I'm on your side. You don't want me. Wonderful. We can discuss it at work. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I do my bit. Every day I deliberately sit next to one of you on the bus. <laughs> don't I get some time off for liberalism? Have you ever taken a colored person home with you? <laughs> Hold on. I never mix my home life with my politics. How, how long do you, do you expect to stay with me? Whether you go as baby, I go as. <laughs> oh, civil rights used to be so much more tolerable before the Negroes got into it. <laughs> Bless you, Jules Pfeiffer. There he is. Wonderful. And then we have another guy, Pat Oliphant, who came in 1964 and thought he died and gone to heaven. Uh, because nobody was really hitting it, uh, telling it like it is, as far as he was concerned. Uh, his style was refreshing and exuberant, and his commentary was unforgiving. Yeah, by the way, uh, the, uh, the story I love, because I interviewed him uh, a year after he was here and had already won the Pulitzer Prize, 
uh, was he told me how he won the Pulitzer Prize. At that time, you didn't do it for a portfolio, you did it for a single cartoon. And he simply got that old Gerald Johnson book of, of Pulitzer Prize winners. He studied them carefully and proceeded to, to draw the worst cartoon he had ever drawn <laughs> and won the Pulitzer Prize. He'll tell you the same thing, but so I'm, I'm not telling tales out of school. So when a lot of people were not really telling it like it was, he was saying that, you know, it wasn't all on the up and up. We have the rioters running out. I, you, you think of this as probably Detroit. And uh, it just, uh, that's unforgiving. Let's tell it like it is. This is my, one of my favorite lines. I forget Mary, D Mary Daly's orders are those shoot and kill or maim and cripple. And he's got his little penguin down there. Do you still call that a dingbat cartoonist? Will you throw in a, sub, a, sec, a second symbol to give you a second uh, opportunity to say something? Do you ever pertinent. feel a little lonely? Yeah. <laughs> now, pr presidents, as you guys well know, uh, really become the symbols from their moment in time. And we're going to do a quick run through of symbols. Okay, so we're going to run through this so we can get to the back end. Because yeah, okay. uh, you all know this. President, okay. All right, who, who is it? Jackson. Hey. Lincoln. Oh, this is very interesting. Look right here. These are all of his various followers, and free love followers, by so forth. That's, that's the, the Mormon. And the Mormon says, I want religion. I want religion. I want religion. But he is, there's free love there. There's, you can see your Irishman back here. You've got. Uh, I want one. religion abolished and the Book of Mormon made the standard of morality. This is 1860. There's the Mormon. Huh. I don't think I'd ever seen a Mormon before, uh, in, yeah, in cartooning yeah. before, and I, I, I was came up, noticed it yesterday. Okay, another voice for Cleveland. Do you, you all know the story behind that? He had had a child out of wedlock. The great thing is he may not have had a child out of wedlock. It might have been a friend of his, but nevertheless he took, he, he, he took the blame and he did <coughs> compensate the, the woman. Mama, where's your pa? Where's Gone to the White House, ha, ha, ha. Yeah, there, there you go. All right, Th these I'm going to go through quickly because I'd like to get to the back end. Uh, so if you, any of you want to ask about them later, uh, we'd be glad to fill you in on them. Uh, these are three FDR famous ones. A great one. Harry Truman, Whistle Stop Tour. One, uh, really one of my favorites. <laughs> David Levine, uh, the Vietnam. gallbladder operation becomes the scar of Vietnam, uh, the shape of Vietnam. A uh, great Paul Zepp, the Vietnam scepters, scepters. Yeah, yeah. And I love this John Fisch Fischetti one. Sunrise, all the foreign troublemakers going Vietnam to sleep, and all the domestic ones, civil rights, waking up. Here, here he comes now. Uh, because you all know more or less the Herb Block story and his battle with uh, Richard Nixon, uh, let me just go through it. But the, the fun story is that when uh, Herb Block, who hated uh, Nixon, was asked by his editor when he became vice president. No, pre uh, president again. Nixon became comes president, back president, president again. Join the good and kind and true, the faithful, just and brave. Grasp this razor in your hand and give this man a shave. <laughs> there he is. And he did. <laughs> One free shave, right? This. And no, but not for long. Uh, <laughs> and everybody uh, was just going to town on Nixon, Watergate, the tapes. Tony off. Kissinger carries the world. Nixon the tapes, Jeff, Jeff McNally, uh, Judge Sirica's trying to, to, to make this all kind of work out. 
but only one got on Nixon's enemy list, hey. and that was Paul Conrad. <laughs> His own worst enemy. And here is a takeoff on Shakespeare where, you know, Nixon kind of cast off everybody to protect himself. So he's looking at the scars, the skulls of everybody that has gone. He's, he's kind of given up. We don't see Shakespeare used in many cartoons these days. The 19th century were full of Shakespeare. Macbeth, Hamlet, Lear, they were all figures in cartoons. I knew them well. And this is, I, I think, everybody's fav favorite, where you have, if you look closely, you can see the names of Haldeman, uh, Ehrlichman, uh, Mitchell, all within that web. A skillful, skillful drawer, a, a absolute beauty. They had one out yesterday at the Library of Congress, and it was very small, and just the delicateness of a Conrad's line, just take your breath away. So, <laughs> Who could that be? <laughs> needs no introduction, another David Levine. And then you can't get elected president if you're, and this was uh, Jim Borgman, once again, he sums up things ever so nicely, 1983. And as we saw, uh, some things do change. And now we come up to the last election, and it's, it's 2008, and you've got Sandy Huffaker giving you this. Only, as you guys all know so too well, that you're being asked to do far more than just one black and white drawing. You're being asked to do color. You're being asked to blog. You're being asked to, to fan, uh, join Facebook. You're being asked to do almost everything. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's gotten tough. This is uh, Gordon Campbell, and uh, he's a, a local cartoonist. We use him in our book. And uh, when he did this cartoon, he thought he died and gone to heaven and that it was the best, best thing he'd ever done. And about, about two weeks later, the, you know, the guillotine, he says, was rumbling into the newsroom, and his job was, was one of the first to go. Our friend Matt Worker uh, does a wonderful panel, and we only use three of these here, but they're five. Oh. The cartoonist place in the media landscape, the first two million years. Cartoonist. Um, move on. And then we, we skip one and we come to, from 1450 to 1920. <laughs> and this is the way it looks today. Pretty, pretty overwhelming, but I, I think I, I love this series and I think it really tells us where we were uh, cartooning and the media uh, newspaper stand today Still as well. Still can't wake up his dog. Though. Right. When Cal uh, lost his job uh, from the Baltimore Sun, and aren't we glad that they came back to him on two knees asking him to come back, uh, he decided that he would turn his attention and his W into a uh, animation. And this was his first attempts back in, in 2008. And now on to the super delegate round. The war in Iraq. What should the U.S. do next? Senator Clinton? We should bring our troops home in a safe and deliberate fashion. Wrong answer. Senator Obama. Bring our troops home immediately, without delay. I'm sorry, that is also incorrect. President Bush. Oh, me? Oh, right. <clears throat> Mr. President. Uh, deal. Uh, no, 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 uh, no deal. Mr. President, you need to answer this question on the subject of Iraq. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. Oh, I've got an answer. Uh, it's my job to answer. I, I am the answerer. And your answer is? Uh, stay the course? No? I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. There are no right answers for Iraq. <laughs> Is Anne here? Yeah. I don't know. I'm looking for Is Anne. Is Anne here? Yeah, she's in the green room. Oh, she's oh, in goodness. waiting. Uh, she's escaping us. Uh, Anne won the 2002 Pulitzer Prize, and we all know her well and, and love her. And she was one of the few uh, people, uh, cartoonists, uh, to be honored at, by a Library of Congress. 
huge show. Uh, and only, I believe, her block, uh, Jules Pfeiffer and Pat Oliphant, had been honored uh, in the same way prior to that. The problem was that Anne wasn't making much money doing this. And as, she, as a freelancer, uh, she has this incredibly sparing, go for it style. And so about three years ago, she decided that she would go, four years ago, that she would uh, start go back to animation, which she trained in, and does that for the Washington Post three days a week. We all know Mark. Uh, he was the first person to win the Pulitzer Prize in cartooning for an animated uh, portfolio. On the dangerous and cruel streets of Liberalville, an unsuspecting withered Romney is in trouble. He knows it's time to call for Deficit Hawkman. <laughs> Mild-mannered Paul Ryan by day becomes a hero for oppressed millionaires everywhere when he gets the call. Ready to tackle the deficit with his bold, brave, libertarian tea publicanism, Deficit Hawkman can lift tax benefits for the wealthy over the tallest skyscraper, cutting taxes for rich people and corporations more than Romney, more than George W. Bush. With Deficit Hawkman, the deficit will be toast in... in in 30 years or so. Trained in the intricate and scholarly ways of deficit reduction, Deficit Hawkman witnessed the evils of deficit spending when he voted yes on two unfunded wars, the TARP bailout, the auto bailout, the 2008 stimulus, and the largest Medicare expansion in a generation. Deficit Hawkman can instantly transform into a catfish noodling, deer skinning man of the earth. Then <laughs> proceed to travel into the future and eliminate Medicare as we know it for all future elderly. All while making quick work of Medicaid, food stamps, and Collins loans. <laughs> Deficit Hawkman has brawn and brains, unleashing specific plans backed by specific imaginary numbers transmitted directly to his brain from Planet Rand. <laughs> Romney has a hero with personality, passion, and plans. Thank you, Deficit Hawkman. You complete me. Deficit Hawkman, a hero to Mitt Romney's everywhere. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Mark. Uh, just to wrap up, uh, you know, when John McCutcheon started uh, cartooning in, for the Chicago Tribune, there were 2,000 cartoonists. When Bill Malden came back to cartooning in 1958, it had, had shrunk by three quarters. There were now only 500. And when our friend Lilo uh, today takes to the boards with all of you, uh, the best we can count, I've gotten a couple different uh, from, uh, from all of you. I've got 70, 68, 65, and 60. So uh, there aren't many of you left. Yeah, you should. Right. Historian hey. Larry Mintz wrote, it takes a confident and aggressive society to consider its most serious problems and to reduce them to jokes. It involves a willingness to consider the stupidities and errors of one's environment as less threatening, as in fact, survivable. That's what you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All our questions. <laughs> well done. Uh -huh.